Well, I think we just about got everybody, and it's 9.31 here in the Great Pacific Northwest, so let's go ahead and get started. With that, hello and Happy New Year. <laughs> so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the January 2024 PowerShell Community Call. Hey, everyone is welcome to join and discuss the PowerShell project and its development. Now, look, we've got an action-packed agenda for this brand new year. Um, and so I've posted the agenda in the meeting chat and a link to the meeting discussion if you want to drop questions in there. Now, the meeting is being recorded, so if that's not your thing, go ahead and exit now. And please take a look at our code of conduct. We care about that, and it's a fun read. So with that, let's go ahead and dive in again. Welcome and Happy New Year to everyone. We're looking forward to a great year. I think first on the list today is to go to Sydney. And I think I saw Sydney earlier. Sydney, do you want to start us off by talking about uh, VS Code? Absolutely. Thank you, Jason. So um, last week, we had a stable release of our VS Code extension. This release included a bunch of improvements to the LSP server. Um, and a major upgrade to our testing system. It also included um, some updates to shell integration. Um, one thing to note about this release as well, um, or just the VS Code extension plans in general, is that um, this year you can expect to see about a quarterly stable release from us and then preview releases in between then. If we need a stable release sooner than that, we'll roll one out, of course. Um, but that's kind of the cadence you can come to expect from us this year. I saw Andy is also on the call. Um, Andy, did you have anything you wanted to say specifically about this release? Um, I would just add that we're really happy having moved our CI over to GitHub Actions. It was kind of like a, a, a December sort of fun thing to work on. Um, we struggled over the last year. We're like, yeah, we'd had CI and you know us, we've been focusing on stability and writing a lot of tests. But they were always a little flaky. So we'd try to fix a bug and we'd run our tests three times until they finally passed and the flakiness went away. I finally ported it all over to GitHub Actions. We now can like actually move on our pull request really quickly. Um, which has been very nice. Uh, and we even have like the end to end tests of the server side uh, running against the daily updates to PowerShell. So we're hoping that helps us catch like bugs in the future um, more quickly. So if PowerShell daily, like a new change in PowerShell breaks us, we know before you tell us because um, we have actually run into that before. In fact, we have code that lets you run the extension, it finds the daily install of PowerShell if you're using that um, for you know all that beta testing. But yeah, it was really just an update focusing on the server mostly with a lot of bug fixes. Um, we did find out that the shell integration was broken for a bit and we just had to pull in the update to their script. If you install the January release, uh, all those little symbols that they put in uh, like on the side of the shell, those work now. If you have an error, it shows an error, um, works as expected. Uh, yeah, we appreciate people testing stuff. Um, like Sydney said, we'll have another out in April, but do expect pre-releases to still come before then. Uh, in fact, I think we're planning a pre-release next week just because we have a number of changes that we're incorporating over the next few days. Um, so yeah, thanks for using the extension. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Sydney. That's great. That's great. Now, hey, folks, you, you may have realized um, it, traditionally a Christmas present, um, we shipped PowerShell 7.4 long term service release for the next three years back in November. That's awesome. But this is January, so it's time for us to once again start talking about our next release, which will be 7.5. This will not be an LTS release. But with that, hey, Dumbo, do you want to say hello and talk about the upcoming previews? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, so it's gonna be quick. Uh, we're planning on a, a new uh, a, a release for seven five preview one, which will be out uh, hopefully next Tuesday. So it's it's uh, the release work is uh, is undergoing right now. Well, that's, a, that, that's awesome. And so folks, we're starting that exciting preview role again. And so we really appreciate you taking the opportunity, if you can, to download and check out those previews and to provide us feedback while we're in this critical development stage on it. So thank you very much. And next on the list, Steve, improvements to commandlets. Yes, and actually before I get to that, I actually remember yeah. one other uh, topic we could have had an agenda that follows 7.5. So, uh, you know, we have the annual team investments blog post. So that is, in progress being written. Uh, I'm hoping it'll be published by end of this month or if not early February. So do look forward to that. And I'll talk more about what exactly we are planning for the 7.5 release as well as other projects that we have on the team. 
anyways, uh, the main topic I want to talk to you guys about today is something that came up in the uh, command line working group meeting yesterday. And before I get into that, I, again, I want to thank all of our uh, community working group members. And by the way, one other topic that was brought up in the committee meeting, which has also happened yesterday, is that we're going to kind of uh, improve the process of getting more folks involved who want to be uh, participating in working groups. To do look forward to a couple of PRs coming out, and maybe we'll talk more about it uh, next community call when we have those things in place. Um, but anyways, the thing I want to bring up is we have a number of issues that come up in the commandlet working group of people wanting to improve the commandlets, which makes a ton of sense. Um, some of the commandlets need new capability, they need behavior changes. And one of the big challenges that we have is we have a lot of people uh, that use PowerShell and they have scripts deployed and a small change sometimes seems safe uh, and it doesn't break people. Like we've had this happen with the 7.4 release where I got notification from partners that they deployed 7.4 and something broke because a small change in a commandlet, which seemed safe at the time, introduced new behavior that was unexpected and, and didn't work the way it was had to make fixes or revert changes. Anyways, there's other cases where people want to add new capability and the big question is like, all right, how do we want to do this without adding like, you know, a lot of parameter sets or making it super complex or having parameters that have similar names but have different behaviors or having a switch to change it? Like there's a lot of things that we discussed. And so what I want to bring up and I'll put a link to this uh, GitHub discussion in the chat here and I hope people join. This is um, we're currently like in a brainstorm phase. OK, there, there is a proposal I put up there that we kind of discussed briefly. It is not the only way to go. It's not the way we're necessarily going to go. I want to get some feedback on really like, all right, if we want to kind of get to a, a place where the commandlets are more modernized, they're more uh, designed for cost platform. Uh, I'll give you another good example because uh, I've seen a lot of these issues come up, like get child item. People don't necessarily understand all the complexities where using a wild card and then have include, exclude, and have recursion. Weird things can happen that are unexpected, but we can't quote unquote fix those behaviors because people are likely dependent on those behaviors. And if we change it, even if it's technically correct, it will break a ton of people, right? And so how do you address those kind of things? Anyways, this um, meta topic is in this discussion. So please um, put in your thoughts, put in um, not just, you know, if you have ideas on how to fix this, but also identify problems, you know, whatever. And let's just have that discussion and maybe we'll come to some conclusion that we can kind of uh, take forward. Thanks. That's awesome, Steve. Thanks. And just to reiterate, one of the things that Steve was mentioning was about the uh, working groups. Um, he was mentioning that we are working on a new process. We we realized that the, the discussion list that we had was difficult for us to keep track of. So we're going to have a more formalized application process where applications won't get lost and people won't get forgotten about for months. And so at the next community call, we anticipate having that conversation. So thank you for your interest in working groups. We're working on getting you in. So thanks a lot. Um, and with that, let's go back to Sydney and talk about PS Resource Git in a servicing release. Hey, Sydney. Hey, this should be a quick one too. Um, just an update on PS Resource Git that we are working on a servicing release. So getting some bug fixes out to you. We are hoping to get this release out later this month, but of course, um, can't promise anything around that. I will link the project. Um, so if you want to track um, the work that's going into that release, it's just a few um, few bugs that we thought were important. Um, so I'll link that there. You can see what's going to go into that release. So expect that release out in the next couple of weeks. Um, if you're curious about other things that are going on with PS Resource Get, you can check out our projects. We keep those very up to date. That's with you your can... car. I ain't touching that. It's like five pages of shit. You got to take this off and take this off. Um. Anyways, um, you can see exactly what we're working on. So um, definitely check out projects there and keep um, testing it out and opening issues for us. Um, but expect that to be our next release. Thanks, Sydney. Now, now, Stephen, I have not let the cat out of the bag. I have not said anything about this exciting news, but so please come online and tell us about the March community call. Sure, yeah, so we, um have been getting some requests for a lot of um, community members in Australia and Asia that this time is not super convenient for them for the community call. And so uh, as a way to um, uh, include them, we are going to uh, have the March and the September community call be at a different time. Um, we are still picking out the exact time right now, but 
Uh, we're hoping that the March and September community call kind of ongoing would be a good time for, we'll still have it, it will just be at a different time. So if the time still works for you, um, you're, everyone is more than welcome to join. Uh, we just wanted to have a time that is not in the middle of the night for uh, a lot of folks in, in Asia and in um, Australia. So if you know anyone uh, in those time zones or are you or in that time zone yourself and it's just very, very late for you, uh, don't please, please let them know uh, that we will be announcing um, the exact time very soon. But March and September will be uh, a community call probably later in the evening for us in the uh, Pacific Northwest. But um, yeah, so that's all I have on that. That's awesome, Stephen. I'm really looking forward to that. And hey, folks, yeah, if it works for you, please join us. It's going to be the, the, the regular community call with all of us there just at a later time so we can bring in more of the community and get more feedback and have even more exciting conversations. So expect some great demos um, as we go through this, um, things that you normally wouldn't see because of the time difference. So we're really excited about um, the expansion of this. So looking forward to it. Thanks, Stephen. Damien, my friend, you want to talk about some changes in WAM? I'm not sure what WAM we're talking about. Ben, what? <laughs> yes, uh, thanks, Jason. Um, I, I have actually a couple of slides uh, that I wanted to uh, to present. Sure. Uh, I hope everyone can see that. Um, so WAM stands for Web Account Manager. Um, think of it as a, a different way of authenticating against Azure. Uh, so far, when you're using Azure CLI or Azure PowerShell to connect to Azure, uh, one of the mechanisms we have is called the web browser flow. So you basically open that web page, authenticate, and then you, you return to your command line. <clears throat> WAM will reduce the need of launching the browser or remove the need of launching the browser, and we integrate with uh, Windows Broker to do the authentication. Um, <clears throat> the benefits. Um, I have listed four of them. Uh, it's an enhanced security mechanism. Um, it's a faster single sign-on approach. So your credential. I just had my Microsoft account here in the list in the in in the screenshot, but you can have other accounts here that are connected to your uh, client. Um, it is integrated as the Windows account, and we want to enable at some point token protection. It's not there yet, but that's something that we have in the plans. Um, it is today supported in preview. Uh, we have it in preview for CLI. We have it in preview for Windows PowerShell. And what I wanted to mention or talk about today is that we are looking at making it as the default authentication. Um, it's going to be supported only on Windows. Uh, we don't have it yet. And I insist on yet. We're looking at supporting it on Mac and Linux as well. Um, if you're running the client on a non-supported version uh, for one, we will fall back to the default mechanism of, of browser flow. Um, Non-interactive flows, uh, service principle, manage identities, which is kind of a service principle in a way, <laughs> are not going to be impacted by this change. It's really about the interactive flow only. <clears throat> we have a tentative timeline, and I wanted to uh, to make sure that it's that everyone is aware of that. Um, of switching to default. Uh, for CLI, we're looking at March, and for PowerShell, we're looking at May. Um, we are looking at a couple of issues at this point that can come in the way and, and delay our timeline, uh, but that's roughly what we are targeting, March and May for uh, for CLI and PS. Um, you may ask why we have a couple of months of, of difference. Uh, one of the reasons of that is that PowerShell is depending on the SDK. Uh, so we had to wait for the SDK to be built, and then we can build on PowerShell. CLI is building directly on the libraries. I can dive in, the in those technicalities, but that's probably the main reason of, the, of, the, of those different timelines. If you want to know more, if you want to try out, you have in the docs uh, for Azure CLI and Azure PowerShell, where the information is, how to install, how to use the, the, the info, and the feedback, as usual, on GitHub it is where we get the data, and that's where we listen and fix issues. Moving on, the next improvement, we're also doing some improvement on Azure PowerShell specifically here, on the output of commands. We heard from customers that <clears throat> some of the auth command, mostly, uh, so identity-related uh, 
get easy context, get easy subscription, get easy tenant. Um, the output was kind of cumbersome. Um, we were missing, customer were missing the integration of a link of, of infos. Uh, you were getting a subscription, you were missing some info. The, the number of columns were kind of hard to read. Um, so we've done some changes to, uh, to rationalize a bit how we display the output. Uh, try to make it easier to read and as well as easier to uh, to handle in script. Um, it's not a breaking change. We're really focused on the UI and not on the object model that is behind the object returned. Um, it's available today in preview on AZ account, uh, version 2.4, 2.14 preview. Uh, so you can download it and try it out. Our plan is to release it as a GA on February 6, which is Tuesday, the first Tuesday of February. So that's two weeks from now. Until then, you can try out if you find issues. If you find something that you don't like with that output, let us know. We can make quick changes by, by then. Um, here you have a screenshot of the Get Easy context. Um, and we've also looked at the Get Easy subscription. I've tried to hide some IDs here, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but you get the idea of having a bulk of, of a table, and now we, we make it easier to read. Um, uh, again, try out report issues on GitHub, and uh, and that's that's kind of the two two updates for the Azure command line tools. Oh, that's awesome! I got a note here that uh, you also want to talk a little bit about the Azure PowerShell um, authentication command. Was, was that part of the WAM conversation that you were having? That's the command I was talking about. The command output oh. uh, get easy awesome. get easy context. Oh, for. the output. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you so much, Damien. Appreciate it. So I, I, I wasn't looking at the screen, and I, I guess I'm, I'm hoping my friend Sean is here and can provide us with a docs update. Are you around, Sean? Yes, I am. Oh. Um, so December was a slow month. Uh, most of us were gone for half the month, so no new content released. Uh, lots of minor updates um, uh, and, and the the usual kind of fixes, um, but. Um, Yesterday, um, Mikey dropped uh, a big update for the DSC v3 documentation for the Alpha 4 release. Um, I'll put a link in the chat there to the change log so you can see what's changed. Um, Mikey, are you on? Yep. Uh, you want to give us a, a quick highlight of what's new? Yeah, uh, um, that's a that's a good point. So uh, the big the big thing to keep in mind is that we did a uh, major update to the uh, schema um, between the last release and this one. Uh, so the schema should be tighter and a little bit better, um, and uh, it's set up to support uh, multiple schema versions going forward. Um, as we realize, we're going to make breaking changes, particularly during alpha, uh, and then you'll want to be able to correlate. Uh, the version that you're using of DSC with the schema that's compatible with it. Um, so that's doable now. Uh, added a new um, well-known keyword to kind of replace ensure. Um, one of the pieces of feedback we've gotten for forever is that ensure is pretty unclear to people. Uh, and they get confused about what they should and shouldn't use ensure for. So we figured exist is a pretty clear <laughs> semantic option instead. Um, and it'll be easier to code around because it's just a Boolean true false, no more enums uh, and managing all of that across different programming languages. Um, a lot of minor updates. One of the other big things is uh, input um, our uh, global options for the DSC command. Previously, you had to just pipe everything over standard in. Now you can either save a config as a data blob or uh, pass a reference to a file. Um, lots of new stuff. Shell completion's turned on now. Um, and logging is uh, added and improving as we go. So that should be improved again in uh, Alpha 5, I think. All right, thanks. That's Back awesome. You, Thank Jason. you both, both Mikey and Sean. That's great. I love it. We get a big update. Hey, folks, a few months back, I, I, I don't know if you'll remember or not, but we had Clint Rutkus come in and talk about some of the work that they were doing on Winget command not found. I understand he's back. So I'm very excited to see what, what's going on with Winget. Clint, oh, are you here? I am. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, give me two seconds to close the 800 windows I had open. 
Um, okay, so everybody, uh, uh, I'm from Power Toys. I also am on a team called Engineered for Developers on Windows. So our team's job is just to do great, cool things um, and make your lives easier on Windows. And one of those things was, hey, uh, I want to, you know, figure out how I can get an application that I, t I thought was installed on my computer through command line and uh, uh, get it installed easier. So I'm going to share my screen and give a quick demo of this. Uh, in theory, I was going to go do this on a totally clean machine, but uh, I'm not currently. So I'm going to go do this on my desktop. So I'm going to use Vim. Just give me one second to share my screen here. Great, everything is not on there. So here you can see I have PowerShell 7.4, and I'm just typing Vim. And you can see I don't have it installed on, on this computer. I'm going to go zoom in here. You can say the term Vim is not installed. Gives a list of potential things because uh, you can go look at the package managers and also go Winget search to verify, like, is this the one you really, really want? Um, if you typed in code, typically through command line, you'd be like, oh, I want Visual Studio code. You'll see um, the... Visual uh, Microsoft dot Visual Studio Code will come up as one of the options here also. So the goal here is to get you where you need to get quicker on a brand new computer. Uh, so here, if I just went when get oops, let me fully copy it, copy it, paste it and just hit enter and it will fully execute. So if I did. Um, uh, try to think of another app that I don't actually proactively have in here, so I'm just going to type Adam. So same thing, you see GitHub Atom, these are all things, but if I type in code, Visual Studio Code will actually boot up. So this is, the goal here is to get you where you need to go, and we're looking for a lot of feedback here also of, is this the pattern and practice that you all would want? Uh, to get this installed, it's super easy inside of Power Toys. So here, um, we have a command not found uh, applet page. So we first, we detect, do you have Power Toys uh, 7.4 or greater installed? Do you have the Winget client uh, module installed? If you don't, click install, click install. We'll auto install it at the bottom here. You can you get your nice little uh, um, install logs to be sure it's there and click install for installing this module and it just works. And that's the goal is to get you where you need to go faster. Um, if you like the pattern and practice, please tell us. If you don't, tell us. We'd love to understand more um, what your thoughts and, and patterns and practices are here. So we have full documentation hey, here as well. Yeah. I just want to ask a quick question. Um, is there is this going to be on the PowerShell gallery or is there a reason that it's not? Right now, this is literally our first release here. So we're trying to better understand what people's patterns and practices are before we go larger. Um, the other thoughts are click we do other things so we're we're still incubating we'd love to 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 start off a little bit small a little bit more cautious before we go larger and understand the dependencies so our team typically works in in actually applications so this is our first forte into doing the module work so we're like hey are we are we doing the correct thing so um, the goal probably would be we put it on there, but we want to be sure, like I said, everyone is OK with what we're doing. Sounds good. And again, uh, kudos to you guys for exploring PowerShell modules and adapting them as part of your workflow. We really appreciate it. Yep. Uh, other cool things uh, I while I am here is uh, we are actually actively doing a DSC resource for Power Toys also to be sure that you're installing, uh, once you install Power Toys, you can fully configure it. And we're doing kind of some cool, clever things like reflecting off our settings uh, files to then generate the actual DSC resource. So um, here's our uh, draft PR also. So if anyone does have any feedback or uh, thoughts, concerns for how we're doing it, and things that we could be doing better, we're always uh, up for, for community feedback and community contributions as well. So give that one a little bit of a plug. That's awesome, Clint. Congratulations on the work and the release. This is this is this is really cool. So it's very exciting. Um, with that, folks, we're ready to go to our our community demos. And first up on my list is Justin Crody. Now I've seen you out there, Justin, and I just heard you, so I know you're here. <laughs> Just hiding, you know, I, I had to ask, I think so. Hey everybody, how you doing? Um, today I just want to do a quick demo of ModuleFast. Is that a 
pretty significant new feature release. Um, it's something I've worked on the last couple of months over the winter break, break and was able to uh, get some good advances. Can you uh, see the release notes I have up here on the screen okay? Yep, we sure can. So starting, of course, with breaking changes, which is always important. Um, this is no longer a thing. It did require Power 7.3 because I tried to get fancy and use the clean block to do some fancy cleanup. Um, unfortunately, most of the places where this runs still aren't quite on 7.4 yet. Um, so it now goes back to using 7.2, but uh, that's not an issue. Another thing is that module fast um, will now evaluate all module folders that you have in your PS module path, not just the destination by default. Um, this makes it so that it can act even quicker if you've already got the module installed. And also, sorry, to back up for a moment, um, for a quick overview of module fast, module fast is a module that optimizes the PowerShell module installation process to be really, really fast, as fast as possible, quick and dirty, and um, allows a lot of really easy things. So it's really designed for getting modules into a CI build or any time where you just need to pull down a bunch of modules really quickly. Um, and it's there as sort of a complement to PS Git and PS Resource Git um, for those kind of scenarios. So one of the uh, big new features is pre-release support. So uh, module fast now completely supports pre-releases. You can do it by either specifying the pre-release tab, which as you see by default, it doesn't get the latest pre-release, whereas if you do specify it, it will. And these are live lookups. So that's how <coughs> that's like your typical like find PS resource would be versus install module fast. Uh, and then in addition, there's a shorthand syntax here. We can just add an exclamation mark to the beginning or the end of the line, and that'll flag that thing is that you want to be a pre-release. That's there to support certain kinds of scenarios in terms of the layout. And that brings me to my next point is the shorthand string syntax. So one tricky thing with uh, PS resource, or excuse me, with uh, PowerShell get is that if you want to install a bunch of different modules, some of them having certain pre-releases, some of them not, any of those kind of specifications, you either have to use like the module specification hash table syntax, which can get kind of unwieldy, or you um, have to, and there's certain combinations you just simply can't do. Um, so module fast supports a very uh, straightforward syntax that lets you take, um, and we don't know why this keeps pausing on me. I don't want to run. Let me bounce the release notes real quick. There we go. So it supports a shorthand syntax here where you can say, for instance, if you want by default, it's the latest version, or say you want all modules that are less than two, you can just say less than two. If you want all modules that are, you know, version less than 2.3, that works too. It supports uh, wildcards, it supports NuGet syntax, it supports, uh, again, that pre release format as mentioned before, but you can put the exclamation mark anywhere you want. And here's an example where you can specify the NuGet syntax where you can say, I want any module in between 2.2 and 2.4. I get this whole progress bar to go away. You see here that it's getting that 2.3. Um, in addition to that, uh, module fast supports now spec files. So these are things like requires files, et cetera. Module fast has its own version of a requires file that you can specify. That's just really simply the name of the module and that syntax that was mentioned earlier. So you can define a file and this will automatically, you can just point in module fast to that folder it'll find that file and automatically install the modules that are associated with that in any of those kind of combinations, resolving all the dependencies, et cetera. It also now supports lock files. Um, if you've ever worked with NPM or PNPM in Node.js, or if you've used .NET, you've known this. Um, when you specify module specifications, there's reasons like, for instance, um, if modules update, what's even though your specification says like modules you know version two to version three if you have something you're publishing to github and you want other people to contribute to it a new version of a module may come out that may break your module so just to be extra sure using module fast you can use this dash ci command and that will commit a lock file to the uh, to your repository which once you commit that whenever you run module fast with the dash ci command inside that folder it will only install the very same specific modules that you had when you were developing. So anybody else who is doing development work will get the exact same modules you had, regardless of what your specifications say, and regardless what may have changed based on your repos and updates. So that makes it just to avoid some of those little inconsistencies and lets you do those kind of things where um, you, uh, um, it lets you do things like depend about type things where you can update specific things. Uh, Paul, I saw you had hand raised, Jeff, quick question. I can't see the chat right now. I see if I can bring it up real quick. There we go. Uh, da -da, may have missed it. Okay, I'll move on. I don't want to take up too much time here. Uh, 
a plan parameter has been added, um, which basically does the same thing as the what if did. It just because you can't suppress the what if output, which I have a PR to fix that in PowerShell, but because you can't suppress what if output, um, uh, you have a plan parameter, which is basically the same thing as what if, but doesn't show the what if text. So that can be useful. With module fast, the plans that you generate, like you do generate a plan, you can save that off anywhere, save it to a variable, save it to a CLX, and I'll save it wherever. And you can come back and pipe that back into install module fast. And that works just like the lock file where it'll install only those modules based on that particular plan. So this has kind of a very Terraform like kind of view where you can plan what your modules are going to be and then apply them and keep that state repeated. Um, module fast also can read the requires lines of a script. So you can put in a path. If you have a script that, for instance, has a requires line that requires a module, you can point module fast now directly to that script and uh, have it install the prerequisites for that script. This also works for PowerShell modules. So if you have a module that has required modules in its assembly and its PSD1 manifest, um, you can install module fast and point it to that, and it'll do the same thing. Um, the rest of these are mostly just little bug fixes. Um, if you were using git module fast plan, um, that's been basically deprecated. It'll stay working, but it's not going to get any real new features. Uh, basically, everything's rolled into the installed module fast command. Um, that just has to do with the way that module fast bootstraps and such. It just makes a lot more sense to have that than the separate get module fast plan command. And maintaining the API between the two is just too much work. Um, there's a bunch of performance improvements, uh, a bunch of documentation updates. So I'll show that real quick. So if you want to get started with module fast, the easiest thing you can do is just simply do IWR bit.ly slash module fast IEX. And even if you don't have module fast loaded or installed, that'll fetch the latest version of the module and start running it on your computer. The, the reason this bootstrap exists is to remove a dependency on, say, PS Git or PS Resource Git, where they have to go out, fetch the module, may take a while. And the goal here is that if you're in like GitHub Actions or something, you want to get module fast bootstrapped as fast as possible so you can start installing your dependencies. If we do the help on install module fast, we will see that uh, we have a whole bunch of help in here. So the module command itself has a lot of detailed information, as well as all the different parameters that it does, um, what they all do, and lots of individual examples to show you the different ways that module fast could work. And uh, just to show an example of that module uh, demo thing, um, that got edited there. Let's see the changes to that. So we have a module file here, for instance, that um, has a uh, a module. D oh, this, where's my required modules? Where did it go? Well, I lost track of it. Anyhow, um, oh, uh, as of the very latest uh, feature, there is um, there uh, is support for PS depend files and uh, and require module files if you use jQuery's module, and it also supports um, uh, PS resource Git manifest. So if you've written, if you've done, tried out the new PowerShell Git version three um, resource required manifest, where you can write a file and list out the different uh, modules that you want, it now you can use Module Fast to install those quickly too. And I, I'm way over my time as I knew I would be, so I'm just going to show one last thing here. So I uh, ran a test of running Module Fast to install all of the all the AZ modules, all the Microsoft Graph modules, and all the VMware Power CLI modules. And in order to do this, it can do it in 7.7 .7 seconds from scratch, no cache, anything. Find all the modules, resolve the dependencies, download them, install them, and be done. Um, by comparison, uh, PS Resource Git takes about 103 seconds, so about you know about 10 times faster. And you know, and then re recurring occurrences, it only fetches the modules that may have changed or have updated. So very quick. And in fact, I had to run this in an extremely big, powerful. Um, I had to run this in a really big, powerful Azure virtual machine because it fans out all, all, all the decompression work that has to happen to unzip all those NuGet modules it had to be fanned out in order for this to actually like not get bottlenecked. So I'll go ahead and stop there. Thanks very much for your time and check out Module Fast. Uh, thank you. Wow, Justin, outstanding. Well, I need to let the dust settle in my head for a second. That's that's pretty incredible. So folks, target your questions towards Justin on this. That's amazing. Great work, man. Thank you. Hey, Ryan Wakefield, Brian, my friend, are, are, would you like to, we've got the time, so would you like to do uh, your uh, demo on a new version of the original test pending reboot? Yes, I will definitely do so here. It's, uh, I'll admit, a little ner nervous just because I've never done this, so I'm like, okay. Well, <laughs> that's all good, but, man. Welcome. 
Yeah, I can. Uh, so if you, if I can share my screen here, I can show you guys kind of some sure. of the rework that I've done to it. Um, but for those of you who don't know that, you know, Adam, you know, Adam, the automator, he had a script out there that he put out there. It's on the PowerShell gallery test dash pending reboot. You know, it's been, you know, one of the most, you know, typical staple um, test pending reboots. I know there's the DSC resource as well, but um, with some recent work that I've been ironically enough working to use um, the PowerShell universal, I have uh, found some gaps and issues with the current resource. Um, so with that being said, um, this is not a presenter there, Jason. Well, I may have to ask one of my one of my one of my <laughs> friends internally to give you presenter rights because I don't Just have to ah, there we so. go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank now. you. Thanks, All right. Dave. Should, yep. All right. You should be hopefully seeing it here. Yep, we sure can. Right, if you can make it a little larger, that'd be great. But yes, oh yeah, that's what I was going to get to here. Oh wow, nice. I, I'm game with however large you want to go. So, um, so yeah, one of the biggest gaps that I noticed was when you went to do it when you with the original one, um, when you actually ran it with um, in the servers. I've got two servers that are just they're dummy. They're just junk names. Um, and apparently it is not, it is going to be that kind of a day with me. Got to, got to love it how it does this on live sessions. Um, uh, but the biggest pain point is, you know, it's, it's gonna, I have, you know, the server names redacted, but what's going to happen is as soon as it tries to connect to the, one of the error ones, it's just going to kill it. You know, it stops. So if that error one was up at the very first, it would have actually stopped right away. So obviously it wasn't handling errors well. So went through and did some work in that. And so um, I did a little measuring with the original one and was able to get the errors handled. So it's not, it's not going, you know, with this one, you know, it's giving about seven seconds, which, you know, not too bad, pretty good against, you know, there's eight, ser six servers technically. And granted I'm running through a Meraki. So I've got a little bit of a bottleneck with, you know, some hardware VPN stuff. But with my newest one, I will give you guys kind of a preview. I will actually pop this one out. And hey, this is the move to new window type of feature that just came out recently. So um, sorry, I had to do that. Um, but some of the stuff that I work to do is, you know, obviously I create all the sessions first. I make sure to do that. And then I invoke it as a job. And the jobs have actually sped this up a decent amount. Um, to where I've actually got it. I think I dropped another two to, I think two to three seconds, which, you know, off at seven seconds, not too bad. Uh, so I will drop that measure in here. Oops, that's the V2. I need the V2. There it is. Yeah, so it's about, so it's about 4.398 seconds, which, you know, compared to this, so it's a whole, almost three full seconds off of it. Um, now that's off of six servers. I've got this actually where I'm going to be doing this against 20, 30 different servers. And we're, you know, just to kind of keep a live monitor of some of this stuff. And then, you know, obviously that's going to drastically, you know, once you start scaling, it'll drastically reduce. So um, I do not have this on GitHub yet. I'm working on it. Um, I needed to get all my testing done. So once I get the GitHub, you know, up in pro public, I will do so. Um, obviously, I'll contact Adam with respect to him, of course, before I, you know, post anything. You know, I want to give him his respect and, you know, due diligence. But this is just kind of some work that I've been doing and playing around with and having fun. So, Hey, thanks, Ryan. Really looking forward to you publishing this on GitHub. And yeah, um, and, and kudos to Adam originally uh, for putting this together. But Ryan, congratulations. You just presented a great <laughs> demo at the PowerShell community call. So thank you very much. Thank we really you. appreciate you. Come back and do some more. Um, yep. Folks, with that, um, we do have a few extra minutes left. So I do want to turn to my friend, Mr. Brendage. James, do you uh, want to do a demo this month or next month? Uh, we got some time got if you want to go. A quick one for you. If you a quick uh, one would be great. Some sharing rights. Oh, okay. We'll get you some sharing rights. I'll do the uh, pixelated version of things first. Um, so this was actually something I demonstrated briefly at the uh, holiday community call, the when the community ran. Uh, for anybody that missed that, though, 
this has been a big, interesting development in, well, PowerShell and TypeScript land over time. James, Sorry. you should go to present now. Yep. Okay, so let me let a picture speak a thousand words first. You see that? I just ran a JavaScript file from PowerShell. Out. Yes, I got its results from there. But, you know, why stop at that? Let's go ahead and run a Python file, too. So, yeah, uh, the short version of implicit interpretation is exactly what's on the tin. It is now possible to define a language, define that that language has an interpreter, and just, just like that, have it wired up in PowerShell with TypeScript loaded. So, yeah, to kind of go there and prove the point, hello, PowerShell community call. Look, this is a live demo. And just to prove I'm not lying here, there we go. So, uh, this should start, you know, um, hopefully setting off some nice uh, alarm bells in everybody's heads about what PowerShell might now be capable of for the last 16, 17 years. It's been PowerShell as a .NET scripting language. And at the edges of the .NET ecosystem, PowerShell sort of starts to not be as helpful. Well, that's gone now. At this point, we can now pretty solidly break down the walls between the PowerShell ecosystem and any other ecosystem that might hypothetically exist. Uh, it's actually done in a very small series of files. It looks like we do have enough time on the clock to get there, so I'll just walk through how this is working. Okay, so I guess I have one more to open up, and that is the PSM one. All right, so let's start with the JavaScript language definition. One of the big things in the PypeScript land is you can now define namespace functions. This is actually going to define a function called JavaScript.language, which, by the way, the PowerShell gallery does not complain when you import that, and it would be really nice if it stays that way. Um, JavaScript.language is just basically a property bag here, and all I've got here is a file pattern, some metadata basically saying, hey, I'm a case-sensitive language, some information about how I template, and then the big thing here is just, just one line saying, hey, my interpreter is Node. And this is a really major important point here. I'm not building an interpreter for each of these languages. I'm just letting PowerShell implicitly call down to the ones that exist. Big deal. This for each object is what's gonna happen with each output inside of a template. There should be another one coming for inside of interpreters. Uh, this should also, at least in theory, work with all the feedback provider stuff we have going on because it's just making hello.js an actual workable command. How is it doing that? Well, the first part of the pairings here, what's actually going on is, and please don't break this PowerShell team, we've got a pre-command lookup action here. Pre-command lookup action happens before you call any command. See, the problem is without this, hello.js is actually a PowerShell command. It's just a PowerShell command that's gonna open up hello.js with a default file association. This is giving us the ability to have a file association for PowerShell specifically, cross-platform. All right, so in the pre-command lookup action, I have to do a little bit of smart trickery here because I don't wanna end up in a recursive hell. So I have to actually look up two commands I'm gonna need new module and important module. Now, for those that aren't aware, you can use these two to do a post-loading trick to basically create commands on the fly. I also have to figure out that the command didn't already exist, so I'm just gonna grab a pointer to get all potential commands. Then I have to figure out, hey, do I have interpreters? Cool, okay, do I have one for the file? Yes. All right, if I can do that, then create, if the command does not exist, go create an alias, export the member, and go say I have an interpreter and go return the new interpreter's name, which is always going to be invoke interpreter. So let's go look at invoke interpreter. It's a really simple function. I mean, like, what are we, 45 lines? And all it's really saying is, hey, look, figure out what I was called when I went was called. If I was called by my real name, forget it. If there weren't interpreters, forget it. If I couldn't find a match, forget it. 
Otherwise, pick out my interpreter command and any leading arguments and call me with splatting. That's it. In fact, if you actually crack open like a node module and you look at any of the PS1 files in their directories, this is basically what they have. If you run NPM, this is the PS1 that's running, basically. So this is a clean, you know, officially sanctioned bridge into whatever there are other language ecosystems there are. Um, for file is also pretty stupid. It basically has a couple of ways to exclude, you know, because you don't want to always do this. You might want to exclude a pattern or a path. And then it just basically goes and checks, okay, do I have a language name? Do I have a file pattern? Does not match? Cool. All right, you might be an interpreter. There's also uh, got a little bit cheeky and created two new variables. There's PS interpreters. Look at that nice list. And if that wasn't enough languages to play with already, there are also is PS language. Look at that nice list. These are all the languages PipeScript can now template. Oh, I didn't know I had a nice base two number right up there. So, yes, Lua was on the list. Uh, I think I know this flashed by really quickly. Um, at this point, these are mostly public bits. I say mostly because there is one bug fix RE templates and interpretation that uh, is in the hopper. Come out and be next. Um, I think also if I were to take a little feature that should move, I don't know whether to call this upstream or downstream from PipeScript to PowerShell, I think languages support might be it. Because I think implicit inter interpretation should be huge for all of us. And again, underline the point. For our whole careers in PowerShell, we've been boxed into the .NET ecosystem. And that's gone now. We can now talk to every other ecosystem that exists fluently. Questions, comments, feedback, cheers, jeers. What have you done? My God. Uh, or at least let's go for the you know real key one, which is all your base belong to us. And one more time for good measure. Oh, I got to save the file first. Hey. All right. Good? We good? We're great. Thanks, James. That was awesome. Boy, um, also, thanks to Ryan Yates for putting in the uh, link to the GitHub for PipeScript. This is amazing. And I, I, I just have to say, it's it's been a really amazing day for, for demos today. <laughs> I'm kind of stunned. Um, this is awesome, James. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to demonstrate this for everyone. And go ahead and check out PipeScript, folks. There's a link in the chat. As we start to wind down this first community call of the year, um, please, we've been answering questions in the chat uh, as we've been going along. But if you have an additional question, please drop it in. And I'd also like to ask uh, the members of the, the PowerShell team, if there's anyone that has anything else that they'd like to say as we start to wrap up uh, today. I guess I could go another 30 seconds if you want your stocks fully blown off. 30 seconds, go. Okay, not counting the time to reshare. Uh, or get back open this. Uh, one other fun thing that there is running in there is Docker support and support for starting custom jobs. So I just run this one a little recently. Let's see if my history is with me. Uh, looks like no. So let's go ahead and get job. Oh, fine. So here we've got this job running on localhost, which is probably going to complain. Okay, there's my little image coming back. I'm gonna go open up a window here. So this is a Docker service running a microserver, or a Docker image running a microserver, running PypeScript, running PowerShell. And, for really crazy bonus points. Let's see, we got our job. Let's go ahead and look at our PS node action. That's all it's gonna be run. Let's do something crazy and brave. Hey, community. 
get process id did pipe to stop process. Okay. So I've now changed my web server to do this. Oh, let me do one more thing, which is yes node right output. Now oh, let's give it a random number. Okay, so we're going to say hi to the community call when we hit this web service. Write an output from our job, which we're running. Okay. And then we're gonna try the stop process. So I'm gonna go open that up again. Hey, community call. I'm gonna hit refresh. It's not dead. It's not dead. And if I get job ID to receive job keep. So not only do you have a microservice, not only is it a background job that can actually allow us to return both to the client and to the server, but if you throw it into a Docker image and you tell it to kill itself, it just won't die. Socks on? Anybody socks off now? All right. We good. That's awesome, James. Thank you. <laughs> it was worth the additional 30 seconds or so. That was pretty screaming. All righty, folks. You. Last call for some questions and to the PowerShell team if they have anything they'd like to say. I'd like to thank everyone for attending. We're getting epic audiences at these. Uh, so please tell your friends, come. We want to hear from you and we'd like your feedback. So, well, this is awesome. Thank you, everyone. And with that silence, let's go ahead and go with this and end the call. You have a great January month. Thanks everyone for attending the PowerShell community call. And we'll see you again next month in February. Cheers. Thanks.